successful entrepreneurs don't make it to where they are today all by themselves. The goal of this segment is to dig deeper into the tricks and shortcuts that our guest entrepreneurs borrowed or stole to help propel them to their own successes. Join our host, Kent Lloyd, the director of Harmon Brothers University, as he asks his guests what they borrowed, or in some cases stole, to grow their business to success. It's the legal kind of stealing, by the way. Poop to Gold presents a brand new segment, Funny Business, hosted by Kent Lloyd. Hello and welcome to another week of From Poop to Gold's new segment called Funny Business. Today I'm here with Rob Oliver. Uh, Rob a, runs a podcast called Learning from Smart People. He's also a motivational speaker and he's also published several different books. I'm um, really excited to talk with you, Rob. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Ken. Thanks for having me on. So uh, before we dive into the, the meat and potatoes, you are in such a diverse set of segments of, of business. I want to know like, what helped create that for you. So what was, what was your childhood like? Where'd you grow up and, and what kind of like brought you on that process to where you are today? So when I was growing up, I, I was an avid reader and I just, I love to read, love to just learn about new things all the time. And it actually kind of backfired on me because when I got to college as a freshman in college, I, I went into the career counseling office and I'm like, listen, I'm interested in everything. I want to learn about everything. What can you do for me? And they said, well, we've got this really interesting thing. It's a career inventory analysis. And you take this test and you tell us what you're and, you know, are you more interested in this or that? And, you know, I'm like, great. It's going to help me. So I took it and I went back in and I sat down with the career counselor and she opened up the folder and was like, just shaking her head. And she said, I've never met anybody with such a diverse set of interests as what you have. <laughs> You're interested in everything. And I'm like, that's what I told you coming in. And she says, yeah. I said, well, like, does it help me to know what I should major in? And she's like, no you actually are interested in everything. So the concept of the podcast is learning from smart people. Mm -hmm. And so to me, every experience, every person that I meet is a person that I can learn from because they know more about something than I do. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, I've been a lifelong learner and I'm able to take and say, okay, I have some knowledge in this area. Let's share that with others. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it kind of has opened up a number of different avenues where I'm able to, to take the information that I've got and to share it. So how did you get to this point in your career specifically? Like, so you took that test in college. What did you do from there? Okay. So in the middle of my college career, when I was 21, I had a spinal, a spinal cord injury. I was body surf on the outer banks and the wave pushed me down on the bottom. I hit my head. And um, what I found out later is I'd broken my neck at the C5-6 level, which means I'm basically paralyzed from the chest down Ooh. with limited use of my arms and hands. That kind of put my whole life in focus because it says, okay, now that I can't walk, now that I'm in a wheelchair, what does this say about me as a person? Where, do, where does my value come from? Mm -hmm. And I had to, and also the next step in that is, okay, I've got such a limited set of abilities. What does that mean about me? What can I do with those? So just real quick, the story is my girlfriend at the time saw me on the beach, saw me injured. The first conversation that I was able to have, I talked to her. And what she told me was this whole physical thing doesn't matter to me. I love you for who you are on the inside. And that was the kind of foundational element for me understanding that this does not define me. My physical condition, my physical appearance doesn't define me. What defines me is my heart, my soul, my intellect, my sense of humor, no matter how lousy that might be. And so that's one thing. The next thing was uh, my occupational therapist was talking to me about, okay, so uh, what do you want to do? I'm like, no, you tell me what you, what I should be able to do. Cause you know what my injury is, you know what I'm capable of. And she said, no, you set the goals and I'll work with you to achieve those. You may not do it like you used to do it. You may not do it like everybody else does it. It may take a lot of creativity and perseverance, but whatever you set your mind to, you'll be able to accomplish. So that kind of background uh, kind of put me in a, with an understanding of, all right, just because I'm in a wheelchair doesn't take away my value. I am still Rob. That's who I am. And that can't be taken away. And just yeah. because I have a limited set of abilities doesn't change the fact that I do have abilities. There's things that I can do. And so then it's a matter of, okay, 
how do I take the things that I can do and use those to make a positive impact on the world around me? So that became learning to do self-advocacy, took me to doing advocacy for people with disabilities, both on a local, state, and national level. And then from there, kind of people saying to me, you need to share your story. And so sharing my story started at church and then it started to a school and that kind of developed into the speaking business to go out and talk about what's going on in my life. And then mm. came COVID, right? And with COVID, it was a matter of, I'd always wanted to do a podcast. Not that I always wanted to do, but I wanted to do a podcast for a long time. I just never had the time. And now all of a sudden I'm sitting at home all of the speaking engagements have gone away. There's that, and it's like, you know what? This is the perfect time to do this. And it's, it's that understanding that every difficulty that you go through is a growth opportunity, is a learning opportunity. And you can come out stronger on the other side than you were when you started. So that's the real thumbnail sketch of how I got from, you know, 21 years old in college to where I am today, speaking and publishing books and doing a podcast. Wow. That is absolutely incredible. Okay, so to get more to the business sides of things, what were some of the biggest mistakes that you made in developing your career and what did you learn from them? My biggest mistakes were actually thinking that I was going to do things like everybody else does, hmm. okay? And so my goal was I'm gonna go out and get a job and my wife, so I told you about my girlfriend at the time of my injury, I married her. When you find somebody that loves you for who you are on the inside, you, you don't let them go, okay? But her thing was, I'm not going to carry your sorry backside for the rest of your life. I'm not marrying a charity case. I'm marrying you as a man and as a husband. And I expect you to thoroughly carry your own weight, which everybody needs that person in their life that says, I'm not taking anything from you except your absolute best. Mm -hmm. So I was in college at the time of the injury. I finished up college. I got my bachelor's degree and I went out to find a job and it, it wasn't easy. And so I thought maybe I'd need more education. I went back and I got my master's degree in psychology and I'm still looking for a job. And I go out and I'm interviewing with all of these companies and, and I'm not getting any calls back and finally interview with a couple disability service organizations and they love me. Right. And what I'm seeing is there's, when I go into your standard company, they're just seeing the wheelchair. They're just seeing the disability. And they're missing out on everything else that I bring to the table. I feel like I'm reasonably articulate. I'm fairly smart. I come across pretty well, but they were missing out on who I am and what my strengths were. When I go to a disability service organization, like they're like, we see unique set of skills that include having a disability. We love you. We want to hire you. The problem became, all right, so now I'm, I've got a job. They're all nonprofits and the, the pay isn't that good. And right. so now the mistake is, okay, I'm looking to do this as a lifelong career and it, I can't, you, you know, so that's what kind of gave me the push to entrepreneurship to say, okay, if I want to use the skills that I have, if I want to set my own ability to earn, that's where I've got to take the next step and say, I'm going to do this myself. I'm not going to rely on others to help me get to where I want to be. There's always somebody out there that seems to be better uh, at doing something you are. And you talk about that a lot about uh, in your podcast, Learning from Smart People. You, the whole theory is that there's, there's always somebody in the room that's an expert about something. I love the phrase that good artists borrow or they create on their own, but great artists steal. So what have you stolen from all these smart people? And like, how have you made it uh, help your business? It's phenomenal because whenever I start to think about, okay, in my business, what do I need help with? Okay, well, then let me go find an expert in that and I'll interview them under the guise of sharing their expertise with my audience. But what it really comes down to is I'm learning the skills that they're giving me. So I've, it's over a year old now. We've got over 100 episodes. It's, it's going very well. And so I was actually surprised because that idea that I can learn from anyone kind of got tested at the beginning because a friend of mine comes to me and he says, listen, I'm the smartest person, you know, you should interview me. I need to be on your podcast. And I'm like, okay, but you, your job is you're a truck driver. Okay. Like, what am I going to learn from a truck driver to talk about entrepreneurship? And 
it's like my second or it's my third or fourth episode. And I'm like, all right, that's fine. I'm, I'm hard up for guests. Come on, be my, all right. He mm-hmm. comes on. And one of the things that he shares with me is he drives a gas tank truck, like one yeah. of the big, huge tanker trucks. Okay. And um, we talked about problem solving. How do you solve problems? And he says, I can't let problems happen because if something happens with my truck, and there's a leak or something, you're going to end up with a fire. You're going to end up with an environmental issue. It's going to be a huge issue. He says the best way to solve problems is to anticipate them and to prevent them from happening before. And so you've got to be aware of what's going on. You've got to be, you've got to have your routine set out. And then as you're working on your processes, as you're working through this, you've got to make sure that you're following through every step to, to prevent the issues that can lead to catastrophic failure. And I was like, holy cow, here I am, I, you know, he's a truck driver and I'm not expecting to learn and he's dropping that kind of stuff on me. I, I had a, a friend of mine that came on, she's the mother of a child with multiple food allergies and sensitivities, okay? You wanna talk about an incredible learning experience. She's talking about the new normal. Mm. And I'm like, okay, we're in a pandemic and we're dealing with the new normal. And one of the powerful things that she said was, you can't compare the, the new normal to the old normal because it doesn't, it doesn't compare. It's not, out, it's not apples to apples, right? And so she used the analogy of her son gets like non-dairy, non-soy-free, gluten-free, whatever, ice cream, okay? And if you compare this to Breyers, like... It's terrible, yeah. but if you're understanding that, okay, this is a frozen treat and I can't compare it to all the ice cream I've ever had, but this is better than nothing. It, you, you come to understand that, you know, this is, it is what it is and you appreciate it for that. That being said, she also made a really good point. And that is as they've changed their diet, as they've changed the menu in their house, as, as all of this has happened, her son is a growing and vibrant kid who doesn't have a clue in the world that he's got issues, right? He, he plays with, he plays with trucks. He does all of this. I mean, he comes over to our house every now and then, and it just, he's full of life and full of personality. He's hitting all of the developmental milestones. And so that reminder is there too. Just because things are different doesn't mean that it's not progress and it's not growth. Um, So, I mean, I feel like I've learned, I've had over, as I said, over a hundred guests, and I feel like I've gotten little nuggets from every single one of them, whether it be just average everyday people or people that are coming in and are marketing experts. It's it just, they all are bringing nuggets to the table that, that I, are beneficial to me as well. That's awesome. Yeah. That, I, I mean, I can definitely say that I've had similar experiences. I mean, that's the whole point of running a podcast is to meet people like you that, that you never would have expected to learn anything about, well, the kinds of things that they've gone through. And all of a sudden they, they drop these truth bombs and I want to listen to your podcast even more. I've already, I've already listened to a couple of episodes. And I'm like, I can see where this is going. This is, this is going to be good. Um, I think, yeah, I think you're going to be on my, uh, my regular playlist from now on. I appreciate that. And so here's, here's the other thing that, one of the pieces I said, since it's called learning from smart people, you've got the, the learning part where that's me. I'm listening. You're listening. We're, we're all listening and we're learning. They are smart. They've got an expertise. But I also throw in a fun part. To celebrate the people part, at the end of every episode, we do what I call three questions to establish your humanity. Now, I will give you a hint that if you listen, you will find that there's a recurring theme. There is at least one food-related question in every set of three questions to establish your humanity. You know, but just it gives people it gives people a chance to kind of show who they are as a person. And right. so it it's a celebration of them as an expert, but it's also a celebration of them kind of sharing something from their life, whether it's, you know, who was your hero growing up? What did you, what was your favorite class when you were young? I, you know, it, if you're going to be on a desert island, what are the three things that you're going to take with you? And just having fun with it and you know, meatloaf, is it overrated, underrated, or is it the perfect comfort food? You know, just fun <laughs> stuff to, to make sure that 
uh, as we're doing this, it's not all cut and dry. Yeah, that's awesome. You have a diverse set of companies that you work on. How in the world do you manage all three simultaneously? Um, well, I spend an inordinate amount of time in my home office. Uh, and so it's, I, well, here's one of the things that I actually learned from, I think I learned it from one of the guests on my show. I can't, can't remember which one, but the human brain can't actually multitask. Okay. No. And when you divide and you are doing two things at once, the best that you can do is it's not a 50, 50 split. There is the best you can do is about a 40, 40 split. And then there's 20% that is, uh, you know, so when you're doing multiple things at the same time, none of them are getting done well. So I, I try and do my daily schedule to have time where I say, okay, this is time where it's devoted to doing this particular work. This is time that it's devoted to doing this. So I, there's time that is on the schedule to do podcast, whether it's to do the interviews or to make sure that I'm getting all the editing and everything done. That's, there's time for that. Then there is time for doing the public speaking side of thing, the motivational speaking where, okay, you've got to do the marketing. You've got to put out, you've got to find places to speak, got to make those connections. And to me, what I am, I kind of have to block the times out. So that, because otherwise what happens is it all runs together and none of it gets done well. But by chunking, it kind of makes it a little bit easier to, to be focused on one thing at a time. And, and in that way, you actually are able to say, okay, I'm going to take this time and I'm going to accomplish this thing. And you can judge how your week is going by saying, by looking at, have I accomplished the items that I was going to accomplish? Why not? What do I have to do? Is it not enough time? Is it not enough focus? Whatever that is, just to, to kind of make sure that you're, you're getting where you need to be and you have some form of accountability, even if it's accountability only to yourself. So your podcast, Learning From Smart People, what do you want your listeners to take away from it? You've already told us some of the golden nuggets that you've taken away, but what do you want your listeners to learn? There are a couple different things. Number one, uh, I like to celebrate minority entrepreneurs, hmm. okay? And so I want, I want people to understand that all of us have something inside of us that, that is amazing and unique and makes us who we are. There is only one you. Now, that being said, I will tell you, I was, I was really kind of disappointed to find out that there's more than one Rob Oliver in the world. Okay, um, as a matter of fact, the one of the one of the directors of The Simpsons' name is Rob Oliver, and so he's way more famous than I am. And so I was like, okay, um, well, maybe I can be the most famous Rob Oliver with a disability. And um, I found out and that's not going to work either. There's a guy, his name's Rob Oliver. He's a Paralympian from over in England or the, in the UK. So I'm guessing a Paralympian is likely more famous than I am. So all right, all right. well, um, then I had to narrow my focus way down. So I'm the most famous Rob Oliver that um, is a quadriplegic and is the father of triplets. All right, so I'll take that. But but it's that understanding. Everybody is unique. Everybody, everybody has a unique set of skills, but also the empowerment to say, you can take your skills and you can do amazing things with them. Don't, don't feel boxed in. Don't feel like you've got to follow the route that others have prescribed for you. You can blaze your own trail and you can also take a look at the people around you and learn from the people around you, learn from the people that have gone before you, learn from the people that are beside you, learn from the people that support you that can help you along that because none of us are truly self-made. Um, I was listening to Arnold Schwarzenegger did a, a commencement speech, I think, in which he talked about the fact that people say that he's a self-made man. And he says, none of us are truly self-made. All of us have people that, um, that have helped us along the way, people that have given us opportunity, given us understanding. We all stand on someone else's shoulders to be where we are. And in that way, I, I think that's kind of the, uh, the part of the message that I want. I want them to understand their uniqueness. I want them to understand their strengths, but I also want them to, to understand that we're all building. And it's not just about finding people that you can, you can learn from and build on, but it's also investing yourself in others and the importance of relationships 
so that you're empowering other people to, to build great things as well. I want to go on uh, something that you mentioned earlier, that you're the father of triplets. Uh, I read that it's two boys, one girl. I, um, I've got one boy, two girls. One boy, two girls. Okay, my bad. So as a father who has a dis- disability, what are some of the challenges that you've overcome there? How has it inspired yourself or even your wife and kids? So let me just go way back to even, even the concept of having kids, right? Sure. So my wife and I have been married for several years and she we're talking about starting a family. And I'm like, I don't know what kind of dad I'm going to be. I can't throw a football. I can't build a tree house. Like those, those aren't on my radar. And we talked about it. We prayed about it. And eventually my wife, who is a very wise woman says to me, what is it that a dad does? A dad loves his kids, no matter what a dad teaches his kids, what's right and what's wrong. And a dad is there for his kids when they need them. I'm like, okay, I can do all those things. So we went through a lot of different experiences, you know, trying to have kids, ended up doing in vitro. And I remember my wife um, goes, you know, gets the pregnancy test and it's, it's positive. And like, this is phenomenal. She goes for her first sonogram and they're like, "Um, we found two. So you're having, I'm like twins. This is great. I love it. They went for her next sonogram. They're like, yeah, we've picked up a third heartbeat. And my response to that was like, all right, stop the sonograms. No more because they're multiplying in there, right? <laughs> but, but it challenged me as a dad to say, okay, what is it that I can do? Something really cool that happens. Most parents know this. If your child is having difficulty sleeping, you put them in the car seat and you drive them around in the car and it helps knock them out, Right. Well, guess what? I've got my own built-in car right here in the house. And so when the kids were little, if they were having trouble going to sleep, I would sit them on my lap and just ride them around. And that provided just one-on-one time with, for me, with my child, it provided a closeness. And the really cool thing was it was something that I was better at than everybody else. And so I had a skill that no one else had, which was really cool as a dad. And then my kids actually developed a sense of independence and a sense of being able to do things on their own very early on because my wife, you've got triplets, right? And she's by herself. She's not, um, I've got a van that I drive and she has to drive the kids in her vehicle all by herself. And it's like, our kids are learning how to get out of their car seats from a very early age. Cause she's like, I'm not climbing over all that stuff. My kids, when, when we're in the house, I need them to help pick this thing up or to do that. And they're learning how to do things on their own really young. And today, my kids have that, that independence. My, you know, my kids are, I think they're amazing. Every parent thinks their kids are amazing. But they've, they've picked it up by osmosis and just by watching it. And it's funny because one of my, one of their classmates, their parent had a disability, right? And you know, she had she had some limitations. She used a wheelchair sometimes, but she could walk and, you know, and one day this kid comes in and doesn't have his homework done. And Mm -hmm. it's like, what, what happened? He's like, well, my mom has a disability and something and yada. yada. And my kids were like, who cares? Like our guy's got a disability and like, we get our homework done. We don't buy your excuse for why you're not getting stuff done. And there's part of me that's like, you've got to be more sensitive and understand everybody's everybody's circumstances are unique, but there's also a part of me that, that they are looking at it and saying, you know what, we don't take this as an excuse. This is just part of life and your ability to succeed, your ability to do amazing things shouldn't be dependent on the circumstances around you. You've got to make the most of what you you're doing. Don't take this as an excuse. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. It does. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can even take that. Um, like, to get super personal for a second, um, a couple months ago, I found out that both of my parents have cancer. Um, and I, I definitely have felt a lot of emotional repercussions of the entire situation. Um, and there have been those times that I've wanted to crumple in on myself. So the, the idea that, yeah, I've had this like, perfectly healthy family my entire life and all of a sudden everything's changing all at once. Like, yeah, that's gonna, there's going to be an emotional shock to the system for a while, but that shouldn't stop you 
at all from getting the things in life that you want and being motivated and uh, in bettering yourself. Just because there's a tragedy doesn't mean that it has to be the end of all happiness, per se. And can, can I make a suggestion? I, and that is, your parents, I, I'm sure that they're amazing people. One of the things that I would suggest is making sure that you you build a part of them into you. And I don't know if you've got kids or not, but build them into your family. Okay. So for example, if you're able to sit down and talk to your parents and actually have to record something, you know, to do a video, set up your phone and say like, someday I'm going to have kids. What, what do you want my kids to know about you? What, you know, just to have recorded conversations with them that, will always be with you and something that you can pass on to the future generation. Because part of what motivated me to write a book is because people aren't like computers. Like with a computer, you stick a USB uh, drive in and you download all of the stuff and then you just move it over to a new computer. And so you just, all of the knowledge, it's there and it stays, okay? Mm -hmm. People don't have that. The knowledge that people have, it, it dies with them. So unless they figured out some way to share that. And that's actually part of, part of what I'm doing with the podcast as well, is putting my knowledge, putting my uh, information out there to benefit others. And it's going to, it's going to last longer than I will. Hmm. You know, and it's a way for my kids to know, this is, what, this is who my dad is, this is what my dad knows. And so both, I've got two autobiographical books and the podcast are all my way of sharing what I have and, and transferring that. And I really feel like as, as you share of yourself, it lives on inside other people. And there's a part of you that, that is, is in them for the rest of their lives as well, if that makes yeah, any no, sense. Yeah, no, absolutely it does. Um, and that's actually something that uh, both Keith and I, Keith and I, it, Keith's a cameraman here um, and a producer. He does phenomenal work. Uh, he actually has started up a company that records people telling family history stories. Um, and uh, he and I have actually talked about the, the possibility of, of doing that with my parents. And I, I love the idea. It's just a matter of, can we get my parents to come, to Bo uh, come from Boston to Utah? <laughs> yeah. I, although, I mean, this, in these days and age, it's, it's, not a, it's not the same thing, but you can Zoom. You can, there's so many virtual right, ways right. you can do it. So, yep. That's awesome. awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, in general, how do you achieve efficiency and what shortcuts have you discovered to make your businesses run more smoothly? So, I don't have a choice but to be efficient because, listen, like, there. I've got a lot of physical limitations. So for example, um, my, my hands basically um, paralyzed. I've got a little bit of motion in them, but uh, for me to type, I actually have a, you know, a brace that goes on my hand and it, I'm able to type with my right hand only. And it's literally one character at a time. So I have, I've, I found some voice input software, which I use for the most part, it speeds things up. It made it really cool when I wrote the book, uh, when I wrote both books, I was literally just talking into the computer. So in some ways the books read as, as I speak. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like you're sitting down and as you're reading it, you're listening to me tell the story, which is kind of a, a cool thing. So uh, voice input software and um, in just developing systems so that you know this is how you do this. So editing the podcast, I've, I've got a system in place where I do, I edit the audio, then I write the description, then I edit the video, then um, upload them all. And, you know, so it's setting processes in place. And then as well, to go back to what I mentioned earlier, if you have set goals in place, to say, okay, this is what I'm going to, this is what I would like to accomplish. It helps you to keep focused and keep on track. So it's just a couple quick tidbits there. How long did it take you to develop the podcast? How long did it take you to develop uh, both of your books? And then how long did it uh, take you to uh, develop your, your public speaking gigs? So 
I'll start in reverse order. Okay. Okay. Um, public speaking. I was, I grew up in church. Okay. And it was a small church. And so I actually spoke for the first time in church when I was like 16 years old mm. and have been kind of doing public speaking since then. So, I'll, I mean, it's 30 something years of public speaking that developed and morphed after my injury into speaking at churches, which became speaking at schools and then speaking to companies and, and kind of going from there. In addition to that, kind of, I was looking for other ways to share the story. And so as a result, that coming out of the public speaking and it came the need for a book. Hmm. So I wrote my autobiography. It was called still walking. And um, a little while after that, one of my friends read the book and it's like, the book is so positive. Like, doesn't anything ever go wrong for you? I'm like, okay, so I need to write a sequel and the sequel to still walking is called still falling. And it's the idea that just because you have a good attitude and a positive outlook doesn't prevent you from tipping your wheelchair over in the middle of the street. So that was kind of the, the push there. And I looked into getting a traditional publisher and, you know, just getting everything set up that way and came to the understanding that for me, self-publishing is the way to go. So I was looking at this and I actually decided to set up my own publishing company uh, as a side, you know, as a side business and as a way to get my material out there. Um, I actually, I published a third book, which is a kid's anti-bullying book. Mm. And, um, you know, being able to, to do that all under my own publishing title, which it's called Roman numeral nine press. Mm. Roman numeral nine is I X. So when you put it all together, it becomes I express, mm. um, which I thought was, a, you know, a fun play on words. So started with the speaking that morphed into the uh, book publishing. And then from there, um, I had wanted to do a podcast. I heard about podcasting. I was actually a member of the National Speakers Association. Mm -hmm. And we had Tom Singer come to our chapter here and talked about podcasting. And I'm like, this is great. I just don't have time. But now with COVID opened up the time. And um, that was the kind of the next step. And I'm actually happy enough with the podcast as it is that I'm thinking about doing another podcast. And uh, that would actually, instead of it being more for entrepreneurs, it would relate more to the speaking industry, which is kind of where my bread and butter is. So, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the, the history of how we go from speaking in church to speaking in schools, to speaking to companies, to sharing the message with a book, and then taking all that I've learned in business and, um, and, really putting that into a podcast where it's helping my business grow and helping others grow their businesses as well. What is your biggest challenge now when it comes to your businesses? Um, I think that a lot of the challenges are the similar to what everybody else is going through, right? Uh, the speaking industry just took a massive hit with COVID. And so now it's a matter of, okay, let's find out where the, where the speaking engagements are, how to get them. And, you know, especially when you moved to the virtual platform, people are like, yeah, we're not paying as much for a virtual presentation as we are for an in-person presentation. And it's like, I'm not sure where the logic is in that. Is, is the information less valuable? Is there less, do you want me to prepare less? Do you want me to not be as dynamic? Like, what is it that you want me to do less of um, as compared to an in-person event. And it's just, a, it's just a matter of that's kind of where things have gone. Uh, mm. So being able to start that recovery process of, um, I just got my first vaccine shot on Saturday, which is means I'm kind of headed back towards in-person events, which is exciting to me. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I don't think that virtual events are going to go away. So it's kind of finding your way through the new stage and, and, and actually trying to figure out how do I come out of this better yeah, and a more efficient, more effective and making a bigger impact as a result of what I've learned from this whole experience. So what is it that you like the best about what you do? I like 
connecting with people. I'm a people person. And so being able to share what I've gone through and when people are able to say, I connect with that, I understand that, I, that resonates with me. Um, and then there's also this, I mean, to be brutal about it, the experiences that I've gone through have been pretty sucky, okay? Yeah. But the, va- the value of being able to share this difficult experience and now someone else is saying, I learned from what you went through. It really gives purpose to the, to the things that I've gone through in my life. And that to me is also hugely valuable to say, all right, this was difficult, but not only has it helped me in my life, not only has it taught me about what existence is truly about, but it's helping other people to, to do amazing things with their life and to get their life in focus. Who is the ideal podcast guest for you? Anyone that is number one, an entrepreneur. I love to have entrepreneurs on to talk about their journey mm. and to talk about, okay, what have you learned along the way? Because I think, especially from me, from my perspective as a speaker, right? Not everybody has a disability, but the experiences that I have gone through because of my disability are universal to the human condition, all right? And I think the same thing applies when it comes to business, when it comes to entrepreneurs. Not everybody has the same entrepreneurial journey, but a lot of, there's a lot of similarities and the principles that are in place, the principles apply universally. So entrepreneurs are great guests for me, but then also the experts, right? People that um, are talking about business infrastructure, that are talking about marketing, that are talking about uh, social media, that are talking about, you know, growing your business that are talking about virtualizing, you know, they're talking about virtual assistants and just any number of, any number of experts who are bringing in an expertise that's going to help an entrepreneur build their business better. Those are the folks that I'm looking to come in. They're smart and I want to learn from them. Well, where's the best place for them to reach out to you and to learn more about you? Sure. The easiest thing, uh, the show website, it's learningfromsmartpeople.com. And there's a contact form on there. All of the episodes are on there. You can listen to those, but you can also find them. I, I'm on, it's on YouTube. It's on Apple podcasts and just about every other podcast platform that you can imagine. It's all out there and love to connect with people and you know, hear what's going on in their lives. And if there's suggestions both for guests. And if there's a suggestion to say, Hey, I would really like to learn about this, send it in. And I'm, I'm glad to see what we can do to address it. Great. Awesome. Well, Rob, thank you so, so much for your time. I've really enjoyed getting to know you. I was going to say, but, um, I feel bad because like it's funny business. And I don't know if I've told you anything that's really funny at this point, you know, and so I'll share with you real quick, Uh, story. Okay. And this to me kind of sums up a business principle. Hmm. I have this really cool power wheelchair. It literally sticker price on it is like $70,000. Wow. Right. Yeah. And it, I've had this same kind of wheelchair the whole way all along. It's really cool. One of the things it has is a seat elevator. It makes it nice for when I'm getting in and out of bed, because I can put the seat up and it allows to transfer down into bed. Um, but also when I'm speaking, I'm able to elevate up so I can make eye contact with everybody. It's great. The problem is that in the first model of this, it was literally just a piston that raised the seat up. Well, I got, I got my first wheelchair. We moved into this new house and I start running into the walls. And my wife's like, what is wrong with you? You need to go back to rehab. You need to learn how to drive your wheelchair. Like there's a problem with you. And I'm thinking like, okay, this gives me indication in marriage. It's always my fault. Um, I've come to understand that I'm a husband. And in the meantime, eventually one of my friends says to me, like, you're not sitting right in the chair. And I said, okay, what is it? What's wrong? And what we figured out is the seat had actually gotten twisted on that piston. And so my wheels are looking in one direction and I am looking in a slightly different direction. And (laughs) what we had to do is get the seat twisted back so that it matches up now. All right. But as a business principle, here's what it is. If your perspective is off, your judgment's impaired, right? How many times are we looking at something and we're just not looking at it right and it impairs what we're doing? Sometimes it, it, it happens over the course of experience. It happens over the, we don't know why, 
but sometimes we need to have those perspective adjustments that get us back to where we need to be. Well, Rob, again, thank you so, so much for being on the show. It has been an absolute pleasure to interview you. For those of you at home, thank you so much for listening to Funny Business. Please like and share this with your friends uh, and subscribe to the podcast. And we'll see you next week. Want to learn the tricks of our trade? We have them all laid out in our courses on Harmon Brothers University. This isn't surface level stuff here. This is our entire playbook, all our secrets laid out in full, the same training we give our own employees. You'll find courses on ad buying, writing video scripts to sell your product or service, creating the kind of large production ads we're known for, even making short ads using nothing but your cell phone. If you're looking to use video marketing to take your business to the next level, Harmon Brothers University has the course for you. Our students have seen incredible growth in their businesses by implementing what they learned in our courses. Take these reviews as living proof. We've now got multiple campaigns that are in the millions of views and in the multiple millions of dollars in sales. Within a week, we're close to 10 million views, over a million in sales, and most impressively, we've covered 100% of the production costs in the first 24 hours of releasing it. We saw immediate results. Sales went up 10x the first day. The first video we did is over 30 million views. The most customers that we've ever acquired in a single month. I think we had about 26,000 new customers. Go to HarmanBrothersUniversity.com to start accelerating your business's growth with video.